conquered. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna make this work. All right. So first on our agenda are uh, board announcements. Anybody have anything to offer? Share? Offer? Anybody? All right. Now public open time. Welcome. Hello, board members here in Santa Fe, and also those board members here in Concord. My name is Craig Murray with Santa Fe. Well, we know uh, Santa Fe, right? Is your mic okay? Is, your mic, is that mic? Yeah, I'll remind her. Um, hey, Kate, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if we might be able to do a roll call. Oh. I can see you, but not clearly enough. Okay, sure. Who wants to do that roll call? I think I might take a stab at yeah, it. You do it. All right, then. Okay. Mathis? Here. Oops. Do I... Bailey? Here. Pearson? Blackwell? Here. Rosinio? Kohler? Cruz? Glover? Green? Uh, here. Eric Sapson. Higgins? Here. Longmire? Lyman? Here. McCaskill? Here. Kawa? Here. McEntee? Here. Wildner? Here. Perkins? Here. Russell? Here. Schroeder? Schwartzman? Here. Sears? Here. Thongs? Here. Patson? Here. Bonoda? Here. Wagon Connect? Carlston? Withy? Here. Starting ourselves out here for a minute. All right, are we good to go? 16, yes. Yep. We are good to go. All right, so let's come back to public open time in San Rafael. Welcome again. Thank you, um, Chair of Steers, board members here in San Rafael, board members in Concord. My name is Craig Murray uh, here in North San Rafael. I just wanted to uh, speak tonight to the Energy Consortium about anaerobic digestion and that if we could uh, see if there could be a little more view towards that. Uh, there's a statewide group, California Association of Sanitation Agencies, that looks very closely at that. Uh, we just came back from Washington, D.C. and reviewing matters uh, with the EPA. Uh, we have a lot of opportunity, each and all our own districts, with your wastewater treatment plants. Uh, as well as agricultural here in West Marin. There's groups like Strauss and the folks uh, quite, quite adept at it, and, and your landfills. So um, this displaces uh, uh, possibly foreign uh, import of uh, these carbon products and creates economic opportunity for our local businesses as well as reduces uh, methane products. So I think these are all goals that the Energy Consortium would like to meet and I uh, just would like to see uh, some focus on that as part, part of the goals and process of, of the group. So thanks very much. Super. Thanks very much um, for being here and for talking about that important issue. We look forward to working with you on it. Um, do we have any public in Concord who would like to speak? I'm seeing none. All right. So uh, next on our agenda is a report from our chief executive officer, Dawn. Great, thank you very much. So I have a couple of items I wanted to um, report on this evening. First of all, I wanted to let folks know that we're trying something a little new with our uh, remote video connection this evening. Um, the San Rafael webcam feed is directly connected to our video recording system. Um, this is the same feed that's available online to anyone that chooses to go online and look at the MCE meeting live. Um, and we're hoping that that will help with the time lag that we've been having between the two locations. Um, so we'll see. We'll kind of be testing that out tonight. But um, just as a reminder, let's try and 
pause for a couple seconds when we're waiting for the remote location to weigh in, and um, we, we shouldn't have a problem there. Um, thanks, everyone, for helping us improve our connectivity every time. I think we're, we're uh, dialing it in pretty well and, and making some improvements along the way. Um, and just one more reminder that if folks can um, state their name before they speak, it'll help folks that are in a different location put the name to the voice and, uh, and help us all um, stay connected and, and uh, know each other well. Um, and then the next item is I wanted to let folks know that we have hard copies of the second enrollment notice. Um, looks like this. And uh, we have uh, a stack of these available here in Concord and at the San Rafael location. Um, and this, uh, this second enrollment notice is going to be going out in the mail next week, um, but it's going to be staggered. So in order to um, help our call centers accommodate um, the call volumes and be re as responsive as possible, we have um, these going out in batches. So a different batch will go out each week over the next four weeks. Um, and this is the... Um, the last enrollment notice that folks will receive before they are cut over to service. And just as a reminder, the way it works in our new communities is that folks are cut over on the day of their meter read date during the month of April. So we, everyone has a different meter, well, not everyone, but folks have different meter read dates. Um, if, if folks really want to know when their meter read date is, they can call our call center and we can let them know. But that's when the cutover happens, and that allows for a clean bill uh, with, you know, before and after the cutover. Um, after the month of April, we will send two additional notices to customers, reminding them that they've been enrolled with MCE, um, giving them information about how to opt up if they're interested in Deep Green, and information on how to opt out if they don't want to continue receiving their generation from MCE. Um, so those will be coming out um, after the enrollment month. Um, so if you're interested in getting a copy of this to take home with you in case you get questions from constituents, just raise your hand and we can pass one out. Looks like we have some takers here in Concord. Um, so I think Enya is going to be able to get those to folks. Um, and we have some there in the San Rafael office as well if anyone's interested in that. Um, does anyone have questions about this enrollment notice or anything related to enrollment before I – actually, I have a few more updates related to enrollment, but any questions so far? As I suggested to you earlier, I just hope they could send out by city if you stagger them. Everybody in the same city hopefully can get them, or at least in the same zip code can get mm -hmm. them at the same time. Right. It's a good suggestion. I think the the idea is that um, we don't have some neighbors getting them and others don't, and wondering right. if they got don't left out somehow. Right. So and okay, then it goes yeah. On next door. And then yeah, then like I didn't get mine. Maybe they made a mistake. Okay, yeah, good point. I I will find out um, what the if we are doing it alphabetically. Hopefully not. Um, and uh, and and let you all know at least so you'll be armed with that information and also make the. The suggestion, if we're not doing it by uh, community or neighborhood, that we try and do that in the future. Thank you. Um, also, just wanted to let folks know that our our enrollment figures right now are um, hovering around uh, uh, 96 to 97 percent. Um, of our customers are staying with MCE at this time. We do typically see um, more folks choosing or continuing folks uh, opting out after the enrollment date because they'll start to see the MCE line item on their bill and it'll help them understand, you know, what's happening. So I don't think this is a static number. It's kind of in flux, uh, but we're at about, you know, 4% opt out right now and that's probably going to inch upward over the next couple of months, which is perfectly fine and we've, we've planned for that. Um, also, on the enrollment front and outreach front, I wanted to let you know that our public affairs team has been very busy attending events over the next few, the last few months. Um, since the beginning of January, uh, we have participated in 93 events. So that's a lot. Some nights we've got three or four going on at the same time. Um, so we've been real busy. We're also sponsoring a lot of events. So, you know, if there are events going on in your town, you might notice the MCE logo. I, I just saw one at the place where we had dinner beforehand that um, MCE is sponsoring an event coming up at that restaurant. So um, the, those are some of the things that have been happening related to enrollment. And then the very last announcement is I wanted to let folks know that we have established a date for the MCE 
Solar One ribbon cutting event, and that is going to be held on April 18th, 9 a.m. to 1:30. Um, invitations went out last week from our public affairs team, and more information will be coming to you soon on that. Um, it should be a really exciting event. It's invitation only. Um, if there are folks that you think we should be inviting, let us know. Um, it, as a reminder, it is the largest publicly owned solar facility in the Bay Area, so it's a pretty big deal to be um, doing a ribbon cutting on this event. It's 10.5 megawatts, and it created a lot of jobs in Richmond because we had a 50 percent local hire requirement. So there's a lot of great stories um, that have come out of this project, and we're excited about that ribbon cutting. And that's all I have for my report. Great. Thank you, Dawn. Any questions or comments on the CEO's report? None. Um, I just want to sort of point a clarification on our agenda before we go forward. I've just learned that our supplemental packet uh, was sent out less than 72 hours in advance, and as a result of that, uh, under the Brown Act, we uh, will not be considering item C7, uh, which is the AT&T agreements for Internet services for Concord and San Rafael offices, or item 8, which was a proposed amendment to MC policy regarding management controls and procedures for transactions in the CAISO. So uh, we'll come back to those items at a, at a later time. All right. Um, so that said, let's move on to the consent calendar. And Dawn, I don't know if you wanted to make any sort of brief comments about the number of agreements on consent. And uh, just yeah. as a brief description. Before we go on, we're on while well, we're talking about the agenda, I downloaded the agenda today and those items neither of those items are on the agenda that was online that's on your website. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And it's probably a moot point for today anyway. Yes. We'll move forward without those items, but those were in the supplemental packet. And so I think you're making a good suggestion that whenever we post a supplemental agenda that we replace the old agenda with that version so that folks don't inadvertently use that version. Um, that's an excellent suggestion. The good news is that the item in question is um, its not a problem for us to carry that over. Um, so we, we don't need to take that up this evening. Um, uh, but thank you, um, Director Sears, for asking about the items on consent, because I would like to make a comment about those. Um, this is the time of year where we tend to see a lot of uh, new contract renewals coming up on the consent calendar because our fiscal year is about to start. So April 1 is the beginning of MCE's fiscal year. So we have some um, renewals or uh, new versions of contracts with vendors that we've been using in the past. Um, we also have a couple of items on the consent calendar that relate to the new office in Concord. So we have some um, audiovisual um, uh, services that are going to be provided to us. Um, and then the other one I wanted to highlight is item C6, where we are um, updating our agreement with Calpine Energy Solutions. This is the entity that provides our data management services to us and handles all of our billing. Um, welcome. And we've been able to um, uh, get a price reduction um, incorporated into the contract in advance of our expansion to the new communities, which is really exciting. It's really related to the economies of scale that we're achieving um, with a larger customer base that they're um, willing to kind of factor into the price that we're paying per customer. And it will result in a, um, a slight savings this year and next fiscal year as well. So that's my quick overview. Um, Director Sears, thank you for asking. Thank you, Dawn. Any comments uh, from any director on any item on consent one through six? Right. Seeing none, I mean, I'd entertain a motion to approve. I'll move approval of item C1 through C6. And this is Director Patson. Patson. Lyman, second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstentions? Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, so uh, moving on to item five on the agenda, which is the new residential time of use rate. Uh, Justin, are you kicking this off for us? I am. Thank Excellent. you very much, Director Sears. Uh, members of the board, uh, on Monday, uh, pg &E established the new rate, ETOU C3, residential time of use, peak pricing, 4 to 9 p.m. every day which is a, a, a very verbose rate name, but also is uh, fairly self-explanatory. Um, the rate will serve customers on the upcoming PG&E default residential time use pilot. The rate is 
designed with pricing signals to incentivize customers to shift their usage off of the peak hours between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. and as part of PG&E's broader efforts in residential rate reform towards moving to default residential time of use rates in 2019 or 2020. Uh, MCE is also electing to try to participate in this pilot with PG&E. We would like to better understand how these transitions impact our customers and what we can learn for how they might be impacted and how the agency itself could have any impacts of these full default transitions. So we've been partnering with PG&E to make this available to our customers. We started work on this about a year and a half ago and we're just about to see the program uh, rolled out. There have been notices sent to our customers between January and April of this year. To make this rate available to our customers, we need to establish our own analogous time of use rate to the pilot rate that's being used by PG&E. The rate uh, that is included within this document, these figures were approved by executive committee on March 2nd. The bigger picture look at what the program entails, uh, the approximately 10,000 of MC's residential customers were selected to participate in this pilot. Uh, we did exclude a couple of customer groups based on uh, groups that are being excluded from PG&E's pilot, such as those with uh, who are on what, what's called the medical baseline rate and a couple other groups. In particular, we did exclude customers who were part of the current expansion in Contra Costa County because both these, both this pilot and MC's expansion are launching in April and we are concerned that having two different programs, both of which involve opt-out mechanisms and enrollment mechanisms would be confusing for customers and wouldn't be a good experience. As of February uh, 28th indicated here, approximately 9% of MCE's customers that were selected for this pilot elected to not participate in it. Uh, however, about 40% of those, 50% of those in that range, uh, selected a different time use rate instead, which they identified was a better rate for them. These numbers have been updated a little bit since then. PG&E just reported today that about 12% of our customers are declining to participate in the pilot and that the others will be transitioned over in April. So for the rate itself, uh, what we did is we looked at MCE's basic residential rate, which is about six tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour, less expensive than PG&E's rate right now. That's a savings of about two and a half percent on the typical residential bill. And we took that same rate reduction and we applied it to each of the time of use periods, the summer peak, summer off peak, winter peak, winter off peak, and we applied that same reduction across the board. There's some small differences in each of these rates because pg and &E rates go all the way out to the uh, thousandth of a cent, and our rates only go out to a tenth of a cent, so there's some slight rounding that has to occur to accommodate for that. Staff is requesting that this rate be made retroactive to March 1st, uh, while we don't know of any customers who are currently participating in the rate, um, and it's unlikely that customers would participate in the rate before April 1st, we just want to ensure that if a customer does sign up early, that we're able to go back and build them properly for that usage. Uh, one last note is that the rate name, as mentioned earlier, is extremely long. We, in fact, can't accommodate it on the bills that we provide to PG&E. So as a interim measure, we suggested just using the short version of the name ETOU C3. We're working with PG&E right now to update what we can include on customer bills so that we can include longer rate names as well as rate descriptions. And we're hoping that that will happen um, sometime later this year. Any questions? I, I have one. So when the 10,000 customers were notified, and this is Don Tatson again. Um, when were they told that the rate would become effective if they didn't opt out? Uh, they were first notified in January. They've been notified each month since then, including varying levels of notification, which include both MCE logos, PG&E logos, 
include uh, information on comparisons of what their current usage would look like applied to the new rate versus their current basic residential rate. And uh, they're told that they would go into effect in April. Okay. So I guess my question then is, why are we then mandating that it's going to go into effect in March if they're told it's going to go into effect in April? Because uh, customers have the option of signing up for the rate early once it goes into effect with PG&E. We have been sort of waiting for PG&E to file this advice letter, which was expected uh, much earlier uh, in the month, if not earlier in this year. They only just filed it on Monday. So at this point, I believe customers should be able to switch over to that rate if they want to. Um, but they would have to call PG&E and actually go ahead and make that rate change. This is just sort of a, um, uh, a matter of being careful just in case we have one customer who signs up early and uh, making sure that we have a rate to bill them at. So I guess then, then will all 10,000 customers be switched to that rate or just the ones who sign up for it? Uh, just just the ones that elect to participate in the, the pilot. If customers um, go into PG&E's mini site or to their regular My Energy portal or contact PG&E and say that they would rather stay at the basic residential rate they're at right now, which uh, looks like at least 6% or so of the customers selected for the pilot have done, um, PG&E will not transition them to the new rate and they'll remain on our basic residential E1 rate. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from board? Yep. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, the, the question was whether or not the pilot included uh, deep green customers. Um, it would include deep green customers. Yes. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right. Seeing none. Would someone like to make a motion? Don't be shy. All right, someone in Concord, we have a really shy group here in San Rafael. All right, well, so. this is Don Tats again. I'll move that we, uh, we adopt the res residential time of use generation rates uh, retroactive to March 1st for those people who have signed up for them. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? <clears throat> All right, very good. Thank you very much. All right, so moving on to item six on our agenda, which is an update on our procurement authorities. Uh, Beth, are you in charge of this one? All right, make sure that, no, you're not on. There you go, perfect. There we go. All right. Okay, thanks. So this item is um, to reflect a couple of changes. Um, one of the changes is simply just structural. Uh, one of Currently, all of our contracting and delegation of authorities is contained in one resolution. Uh, what, what I've proposed here is to break this into two separate resolutions. One is for energy services uh, and energy products. That is generally those are addressed in a standalone way. Um, and in order to have a clear deliverable for counterparties who want to understand who has the authorization to execute which power supply <laughs> contracts, um, that is going to be the most streamlined approach for doing that. There are no substantive changes to um, that item. And then the other component is contained in the second resolution before you. And this has a couple of, uh, this has a couple of different changes. Could you have the next? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so basically this is broken to for energy procurement authority. Um, there's no change. For other procurement authorities, so just the day-to-day the -day contracting of the agency that does not relate to energy matters, there are three uh, changes that are being proposed. One is that we are going to designate a purchasing agent. And the idea there is that in the future, you can have several purchasing agents. So in your communities and towns, you may have other people within the agency that may have contracting authority. We're not asking for anybody else other than the CEO to have that authority here, um, but it just allows for that to happen in the future in a more streamlined way. Uh, second is the, 
the purchasing agent authority, so the CEO's authority, that would change. Uh, it would increase the authority of the CEO from $25,000 per fiscal year per scope of work up to $100,000. And also it provides for certain exemptions to procurement rules where, um, where certain spending limits might not be applicable. So for example, postage, which is not a negotiable rate and other things, um, these are exemptions that we've seen also in um, the county of the County of Marin's procurement manual. So we took that and modified it for our um, business needs. So basically tariff products and services. Another good example would be um, the, the billing charges, the tariff billing charges that pg e charges to us. So um, next slide. So again, like this is just going through sort of line by line. The first resolution is just relates to energy procurement authority. There are no changes to existing uh, delegations of authority. Next slide. Designating the CEO as a purchasing agent. So the only purchasing agent is the CEO. Uh, so there's no functional change here. It's just a, a change that allows for future revision if the board chooses. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Here, there's uh, the increase of purchasing authority goes from 25000 to 100000 And I did want to note a couple of things here. Our agency has grown significantly. And so uh, this figure actually represents 0.02% uh, of our annual budget. And as other CCAs have also emerged, this has been a standard uh, contracting threshold for CEOs, and that's consistent with Monterey Bay, Silicon Valley, and Lancaster Choice, Lancaster having a slightly higher level. Next slide. And then again, these are the exemptions, so utilities, tariff costs, costs and fees, and you know notices that were required to send is mostly clarification. Next. So, um, the recommendation of the executive committee was to adopt both proposed resolu resolutions um, as it's set forth here. Are there any questions? I am glad you included the information about there having been a thousand fold increase in our budget that does put this, <laughs> yeah. put this request in, yeah. some, in context, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. I, yeah, I recall the early days of the budget, it didn't look like the current one. No, it really didn't. And it, you know, it's helpful to have that in here. Going from 330,000 to 385 million is, is rather <laughs> something of an increase. And yep. um, so, th so that, that's a helpful context. Yeah. Um, questions? Yeah, uh, Sloan, please. Uh, Sloan Bailey, before yep. we hear it. Uh, no, you're no. no. Now you're yeah. Okay. Beth, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, can you just explain what, what's an example of the sort of transaction where there would be the procurement rules are inapplicable and feasible or unnecessary? Yeah, so the, those examples are things like um, we are legally required to send out notices to all of our customers. So um, those printing costs associated with that are sort of baked into what our expected costs are. Postage costs are another example. Tariffs, fees, and services. So we have a per bill um, fee that's charged to pg e by us. And there's no negotiation available from that, similar to um, electricity costs or other utility costs, sewer costs, um, garbage and waste disposal, for example. Um, there's no negotiating for those services. OK. Do you have anything else, Sloan? No, I mean, it's, it feels a little vague to me. It's OK. Um, uh, I'll go that it, it tracks the county of Marin's procurement manual. I assume that's been thought through. I wouldn't have minded. It's, it's a little unusual. That's why I asked the question, mm -hmm. too, for some sort of vague and non-specified reason. I had assumed it was like a disaster or an emergency or something. The examples that you used struck me as the sorts of things that you could plan for because they're known well in advance. 
so there'd be time mm -hmm. to get authority. That's why there was kind of that pause, Kate, because mm -hmm. I couldn't think through yeah. why is it that a postage co mm -hmm. cost is something that wouldn't be subject to the normal rules mm -hmm. because it seems like something is not going to happen suddenly and would require... I'm not saying it's not a reasonable... Mm -hmm. Exclu I'm not saying it's not reasonable to have exclusions from procurement limits. Just the examples you used didn't really didn't really do it for me. That's mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, point taken. I, what we what we did was we took a look at the County of Marin procurement manual. Um, they have quite a bit longer of a list, and so we we kind of pared it back from there. Uh, but the County of Marin finds that postage costs are the sorts of things that don't need to like their. That's the sort of thing that's in the County Marin's manual? Yes. I don't think any of us as electeds on our boards are all that concerned about voting on whether to approve postage costs. So that's an example of something that seems appropriately excluded for me and, and well within the CEO's responsibility. We have a question here in Concord. Okay, sorry, I can't see you, so please go forward. Uh, to you, are you comfortable with this? Um, yeah, the question, I know that um, Director Bersan is speaking, the City of Concord. He's not real close to a mic, so I'm just going to repeat the question to make sure everyone uh, could, could hear. Um, so he's, he was just asking, uh, I think me, uh, the, this is uh, Don Wise speaking, if, if I'm comfortable with the recommendation. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we've spent a couple of months looking at this, and, and some of the um, factors, as uh, Beth Kelly uh, alluded to, you know, we have um, examples of other CCAs operating. Our budget has expanded so much that we've kind of grown out of the old um, the old mandate, and we've actually had a couple of times where we had to, where we held a, an executive committee meeting only because we were needing to approve contracts that were um, pretty small. I, th I think $100,000 is, is um, probably the right amount right now, kind of given where other CCAs are. Um, it is a very small percentage of our budget, but I, th I think that it's going to give us um, – it's going to create some efficiencies as far as um, preparing material to come to the board that often isn't okay. discussed or necessary. All right. Yeah. Not a problem. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions in Concord? Other questions or comments in San Rafael, Greg? Yeah, I, I've, I've got a, a question, Beth. I, you know, when I look at the actual resolution for it's 1804, and Group Three is the exemptions, and you you discussed them: utilities, tariffs, notices by law fees. I look at these, and and I do. Are these going to actually exceed a hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, I. I'm fine with them being in there, but it, but in reality, it, it didn't seem like they were going to exceed 100000 Yeah, so here's here's another example, um, and I think that maybe Don or David might be better equipped to address this one, is, you know, one of the items here is the, is the CAISO fees and costs, including MCE's estimated aggregate liability. So this relates to a change to us becoming our own um, scheduling coordinator, coordinator. And so as we have uh, energy out in the market through KISO, we're required to basically post collateral for the amounts that we're transacting on. And that can go into the millions. Um, and it's, it's just a cost that there's no negotiating with KISO on it. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> And turn on your, yeah, it's okay. Thank just, you. just to clarify, it's not a cost um, when you make a deposit. It's, um, it's a deposit. Um, we, we get it back. And and then there's other things that we do not get back, um, which do exceed a hundred thousand dollars. So, for example, um, we line item budget, for example, for um, PG&E's fees that they charge to us for billing. And so that is a tariff that's approved by the Public Utilities Commission. So that is, is in excess of $100,000. And, and then, so, my, so that's fine. I'm glad that that language is in there then. And then my comment is that even though 100000 is less, a very small percentage of our overall purchasing, this particular resolution is about the non-power purchases. Mm -hmm. And power is um, $183 million of our $200 million budget. So this is actually, a better comparison would be this is 100,000 on a $20 million budget. And I, I'm not saying that that's not a good appropriate 
threshold, but it but it is kind of disingenuous to compare it to the 200 million when 1803 is the purchasing authority for power. So this really should have been compared to the non-power purchases per budget. So that I'm yeah. still comfortable with it. It's it's a it's in line with you know cities with comparable uh, general fund budgets. Though. Okay, point taken. Thank you. Yeah. Good point. Rupert, was there something you wanted to say? Your hand was creeping towards the light. I guess I look at it the complete opposite way around, which is if you're the CEO of an organization that has a budget of $400 million, um, inevitably there are going to be contracts and other things that have to be done fairly quickly. And um, that uh, in many ways, cutting back on the level of bureaucracy, cutting back on the number of committee meetings and other things is actually a good thing. And I personally wouldn't have a problem with this being raised to a couple of hundred thousand or something higher that actually is more representative of the nature of the business now. That this is you know, essentially a public company. This is a substantial organization now. And um, it isn't a mom and pop type business. It isn't one town. It's, it's, it's way outgrown whatever it was originally thought to be. And uh, we ought to look at it in that context. Yeah, Sashi. Sashi McEntee, Mill Valley. Uh, Beth, can you, what, what, can, what does consistent with the budget mean? Does that mean that it, it has to be within the amount budget for that thing? Or could it be that, uh, well, we have a, you know, X amount of budget and we moved, you know, a whole bunch of it over to this other category? Yeah, so there are a couple of elements here. And we actually ran into this originally with energy supply contracting, um, which is, uh, there's an already approved budget, so we have to stay within the bounds of the already approved budget. But say, for example, you have um, like a, a dues and subscription that lasts three years, and you have expected budget levels for that. It, it's just consistent with, it's not, um, it's not any shifting around of what's been authorized by the, by the board. Okay, I'll make a motion unless there's more discussion. No, I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments from Concord? Any, any other questions or comments from anyone in Concord before we have a motion maker here in San Rafael? You've already seconded. I think we have a second ready here. Okay. Hey, no, you make the motion, Sloan, and we got a second in Concord. Okay, here. I'll move. We adopt proposed resolution number 2018-03, rescinding resolution number 2017-02, and delegating energy procurement authority. And we okay. have a second. Great. All right. Very good. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? All right. Very I'll good. Thank you, everyone. Thank I'll you make guys. a second motion adopting proposed resolution 2018-04, designating this chief executive officer as purchasing agent and delegating purchasing agent authority. Second. Athos. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? That's approved. Very good. Thanks very much. I know we've been working on this for a while. Okay, hey, um, next on our agenda, item seven, is a proposed amendment to MC policy 13, our reserve policy. David. Great. Good evening, everyone. Is this uh, no. No, no, there, there you it go. Is. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm David McNeil. I'm the finance manager at MCE, and I'm, I'm pleased to present a uh, proposed amendment to MCE's um, reserve policy. So they, I'll cover a few areas um, before I get into the, the actual, provide some context before I get into the actual substance of the changes. Uh, MCE's reserves um, are, are important, uh, critically important to the organization for uh, funding our, our working capital needs, um, procuring energy at competitive rates, uh, adhering to our loan covenants, um, covering <laughs> unanticipated expenditures. Uh, it serves as a, ra a rainy day fund. Uh, supporting rate stability and um, contributing towards a, a strong um, credit rating. MCE accounts for its reserves as the net position. So on the balance sheet, um, you have your assets, you have your liabilities, and then the difference between assets and liabilities is the net position. 
Uh, as a public agency, the only way that we can move the needle on our net position or reserves is through the annual budgeting and rate setting process. And through that process, we um, make a determination about how much surpluses we, we want to contribute to those reserves. And that, um, so you're, you're, you have your beginning period um, reserves, then you have the contribution during the year to those reserves, then you have end, ending period re reserves. There are no distributions to, um, to any third party of reserves, uh, nor could any third party make a contribution to those reserves. Um, the substance of the, of the change uh, is, is threefold. One is, is that when MCE, this uh, reserve policy was approved um, in uh, 2016, um, and at that time, we set ourselves a target of March the 31st, 2019, to, to meet our reserve target. Um, as a result of, primarily as a result of expansion of the agency, we're not going to get there um, uh, by March of 2019. And the proposal is to push that out an additional year to March uh, 2020. In addition, um, there's a couple other uh, changes uh, proposed at this time. Uh, uh, one of them is basically just to simplify the methodology uh, um, without actually changing the substance of the reserve target itself. So the, the, the targets are not um, changing meaningfully, um, but we're moving, uh, or I'm proposing that we, we simplify the, the target to simply 40% of expenditures in the year forward. So to give an example, um, right now our, our uh, reserves are about going to be about 50 million by the end of this fiscal year. And um, then I would I want to um, balance those reserves against what our ex expected um, uh, expenditures are going to be in the upcoming year. The idea being that the reserves are what's going to, or what's going to happen again in, in the future rather than what happened in the past. Um, so that is the, oh, um, and then um, I added some additional language, uh, proposed to add some additional language um, with re respect to um, liquidity. The, re the relationship between reserves and, and liquidity is, is important. Um, they, are, uh, they are different. Um, the, reser the reserves, is, as I, I mentioned, are, are the net position of the organization. The liquidity are sort of the, uh, the liquid assets. Um, and in order to grow our liquid assets and achieve um, sufficient liquidity, we need to build our reserves. So the reserves, portion of the reserves flow into the, into the liquid assets. And so there is an important connection there, which I highlight um, in, this, in this proposed change to the policy. Uh, are there any questions? So, and I'm going to actually ask Ray, Sashi, and Bob, because I know res our reserve policy in Sloan, too, has been important to each of you in the past. So I'm just um, sort of turning to you first to see if there's any comment or question you might have. And then I'll open it up to everybody else. Oh, yeah. Uh, get your microphone, so. Uh, the only comment I would make, but although David, correct me if you think this is uh, misstating it, is that whereas this policy does in fact uh, talk about a target for our reserves, ultimately the board makes a decision each year as to how much is going to go into the reserves when it sets our rates. Um, so d just so you don't get the cart uh, before the horse. Uh, this simply sets uh, a theoretical reserve, but ultimately the word is going to be determined each year when this board votes on what our rates are going to be. That's ultimately what determines, mm -hmm. by and large, what goes down to the bottom line into the reserves. Is that a fair statement, David? A micro microphone. I would point out that it's it's the rate setting policy and also the budget. So so that that, that together um, determine what we're going to contribute to to reserves. I think a policy, an organizational policy, uh, establishes strategic direction. It establishes priorities for the organization, and I think that those are important to communicate to stakeholders. But I, I agree with you that yeah, we I, can I, amend the policy and 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 and. We, we set rates and, and, and budgets yeah. on an annual yeah, basis. Yeah, I, I wasn't suggesting it was a bad idea to have this target, but just in case someone thought that this was the document that was the determinative agent as to what our reserve is going to be year by year, that's absolutely not true. And yeah, it is one factor in determining uh, what we're going to set our rates as, but there are a lot of other factors like what's PG&E charging for their electricity and so forth. Right. Great, thank you, Bob. Sashi, did you want to say something? Yeah. No? Um, yeah. I have a 
Sashi Mac, do mail value. Thank you, David. A uh, couple questions and then a couple of kind of I'd like to hear what people think. Um, so just leading off of what Bob said, so does the board agree to this policy bind the rate setting committee to any type of action to reach this target? It's not. So this, there's nothing binding about this policy. It's just a signal that this is what we would like to do. So there's, there's nothing, nothing happens if we don't do this, if we don't follow our own policy. <laughs> Well, we do try to follow our own policies. Yeah, and, and we should. Um, you know, we shouldn't have policies that we're not going to follow. But it, it, I, think if we're, I think if we're not going to follow the policy, it would be uh, incumbent upon the board to amend the policy to reflect what the organization what you're wants to do. What actually going to do. And yeah. does this policy, do you give that to, um, you know, banks when you're getting lines of credit? Does, it, does anyone see it? And does it is this useful for that purpose? Um, it, it is. I, I, it is a document that I will share uh, and forms a part of our credit pack that I, I share with stakeholders and, and who are uh, others who are evaluating the credit worthiness of MCE. And, and certainly um, it's part of the story of, of the commitment of this agency to continuing to build its financial strength. Okay. Uh, and uh, you you'd outlined uh, the, the, the purpose of having reserves in your mind is uh, working capital needs, unanticipated expenditures, some, a rainy day fund, um, collateral, anything, anything else that we should be thinking about? What, what's the, what are we reserving for? What's the point what's, so that we can determine whether it's adequate enough that this is what we're doing it for? Well, that's a... Um, and I, I think that you, in terms of the, um, the, in terms of the working capital requirements, I think we're largely there. I think we have the, 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 the funds available to pay our bills. I think it's important to, um, uh, in the setting of reserves, it's important to project financial strength to counterparties and, and credit is a, it's a confidence game. I mean, you have to, you have to achieve the confidence of the of people who are investing in the projects that we're trying to build, that we are going to be around for a long time and, and that we're going to pay our energy bills for a long time. So, um, I think that's a establishing confidence of the, of the, um, investors and, and, and folks who make things, those projects happen is, is very important. Um, the other component that's important to keep in mind is that, uh, this is a uh, this is a rainy day fund. We have um, fairly good uh, vis visibility into what's going to happen in one year out, and two years out, and even three years out. But beyond that, I mean, the the, the level of uncertainty grows. That's just the nature of, of of business and the nature of the markets in which we operate. So these these reserves are there for a scenario which we cannot foresee. And uh, I, I think that's true of any organization that's building reserves. And, and I think that a, a prudent course of action um, for the board would be to support the continuing uh, accumulation of reserves in the agency. Yeah, so my question was towards, um, is this amount, is this an adequate amount? Because that's, I think that, you know, if you're going to set a reserve policy, it should be an adequate reserve policy. And that was just me asking that yeah, to clarify sure, whether this sure. is adequate. And another, um, another potential unanticipated expenditure could be the loss of a big customer or a territory, for example. Um, and so would this be, do you consider this to be adequate for, let's say tomorrow PG&E wakes up and comes up with some new, new way to, 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 to pull back a whole bunch of customers um, and we have a, a big loss of customers in a short period of time. That would be an unanticipated problem, for example. David, we need your mic on. Right. Um, I, I think that there, uh, you, you, we have to operate within the parameters of, of plausible scenarios. And I think um, with that, within those confines, the reserves that we have right now are, are put MCE in a very good position. And I think that the, the trajectory that the, which the board has, has set by uh, uh, approving a budget that will contribute another $54 million to reserves um, in the upcoming year, which is almost going to double our reserves in one year, I think is uh, uh, really important for for the organization. And I think that over the over the by the time we get out to March thirty first, twenty twenty, we'll have accumulated close to one hundred and fifty million dollars worth of reserves. And yes, I think those are that that's an ec excellent target to set. And I think that puts us will put us in a very good position to to weather any storms that that are on the horizon. Okay. 
Okay. And if I could add to that that really great answer, I just had one other um, comment on that. You know, we, we've spent a lot of time in developing this policy years ago. We really looked at what is the benchmark for um, municipal utilities and what is factored in as far as a, you know, a healthy municipal utility, if they are um, looking to get a credit rating, you know, what are the rating agencies looking for? And, and what we learned was that kind of having four to six months of cash on hand is, is what was important. And I think that the, the methodology that um, David's incorporated into this policy is kind of a tighter way of, of looking at what is considered um, to be a, a strong, credit-worthy uh, municipal utility, and, and we're definitely teeing ourselves up to, to be positioned for that. So the, that's another benchmark, um, Director McEntee, that I wanted you to know where you're, we're looking at as a reference point, and that, that's just another example of why we think that this um, target we're aiming for is the right approach. Okay, and then uh, two things I'd like to have be part of the discussion. Um, one is whether or not, I understand using the unused portion of the line of credit as liquidity, but I don't know that I, I don't know how I feel about having that be considered part of the reserve target um, or part, part of what we're using for the reserve target, um, the uh, $30 million yeah. line. Okay, so let me just, just uh, uh, clarify yeah. that the, um, the reserve target is the percentage of, right. a, 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 of expenditures. The liquidity target is, is something distinct from the reserve target. Um, it's something we okay. need a cer certain amount of liquidity um, in order to, to um, uh, achieve the financial targets that, that Beth, or, sorry, that Don just, just mentioned um, and, uh, and have sufficient liquidity on hand. But the targets are different. The, the, um, the liquidity methodology, which includes the unused lines of credit, is a very uh, standard um, methodology for ca calculating liquidity. Okay, so, all right, I, maybe I just didn't it's, get that it's right. It's a so good... The, so the, 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 but so that, what, that's not going to count towards our... That's right. Reserves. That's right. Okay. That's right. All right, I feel better about that. All right, so then um, my uh, last um, request is that uh, um, I, I think it's great that we have a reserve target and that we're discussing it. I'd like it to have greater visibility, and I, I would like to see it reported out annually with our annual financials or some, in some way um, reported out so that I understand that staff is tracking it, that's listed there, but the board should also be tracking our progress towards our target. So I'd like to see that added somewhere. That's a great suggestion. Ray, did you yeah. want to make a comment? Uh, thank you. Ray with the Sol Salido. Um, I have one question and then a couple of comments, if I may. So my question is, um, as a preamble, obviously any um, reserve policy is only as good as our risk management analysis, right, of the overall business to get to um, uh, Director McIntyre's point. That, um, and so what is, our, um, what is our ongoing best practices or attempting to reach best practices as ongoing risk assessment that can then feed into a, an, an annual sort of review perhaps of is this methodology right? Are we covering all of the risks? So that's my, that's my question. Um. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I, I would answer it by saying that um, I think uh, almost all of the departments at, at MCE, if not all of them, are, are in the business of managing risk. Um, the procurement team, um, the legal and regulatory team, certainly the finance area, um, even the, the communications, uh, although it sounds a little bit odd, I mean, we're, they're out there telling the wonderful story of MCE, which, which directly or indirectly really contributes to um, managing public per perception of MCE, which is an important element of, of risk. And this day departments, the, the internal operations department also um, is very important in terms of managing risk through the work that they do. So um, I think that this organization is very focused on managing risk, and we think about it and, and manage it in, in lots of different ways. That plays itself out in terms of the finances of the organization and the financial projections. Um, 
basically in, uh, around um, sensitivity analysis of expected contributions to the net position. So if you will, monthly surpluses, 12 months forward, 24 months forward, what are the different scenarios that could evolve that would impact those contributions to the net position, and, and are we comfortable that we're managing those, those risks appropriately? Okay, super. A um, couple of comments. I, for, for, first of all, from my observation, thanks for that answer, um, I'm actually really confident that the staff has got its arms around the risks of this business, you know, um, based on my interaction with it. So I think that's, that's great. Um, the comment the discussion earlier around which takes priority, the budget, rate setting, reserve policy, and so on, and I look at it just very slightly differently in that obviously the budget, the board's approval of the budget is overriding, and that's determined by the rate, you know, the rates and everything. But in the end, if you were to need to significantly deviate from the reserve policy, then this is a document, a policy, a grounding at which we would expect staff to come back and say, wait a minute, there's something has materially changed such that we have to um, use reserves or not be able to put money into reserves in, as we plan. So I think it's just, it's almost like three legs of a stool and that each contributes and there's almost a tension between them and that's good because then if it comes out of balance, then we can immediately see there's something going wrong. So that would be my only comment there. And the only final thing I just wanted to say, and um, uh, Madam Chair, you scoop me a little bit, because I was going to talk about the 330,000 to 385 million. I figured that was my prerogative. You absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> if we just step back a moment, when we first set the reserve policy in place and then the earlier one of, you know, almost picking out of the air a certain percentage of revenues just to start putting in. To be honest, I never imagined we'd get here and have a real, seriously, and have a real um, um, clear pro forma that within two years, we're going to have $150 million in reserve. How about that? How about, How that? about that? That is an amazing achievement. Mm -hmm. of, it's due to the expansion, but it's also due to prudent fiscal management exactly right. and putting the priorities of building the reserves um, first. So I'm fully supportive of this, and I think it's, this is a very important step for MC, actually. Thank you, Ray. Very well said. So Concord. We have a comment in yeah. Concord. Yeah. Yes, please. This is Scott Perkins in, from San Ramon. Uh, so we're going to, over the next two years, we're going to generate about $96 million in revenues in excess of expenses over a two-year period, so you know, $48 million. Um, I recognize that while we have obligations for financial stability, we aren't in the business of, of making a profit as such. Um, we're in the business of serving our customers with green energy. Um, is two years the right target for, I put this question out there, is two years the right target for reaching the goal? Or is it more prudent uh, for our uh, customers if we use a three-year target? Uh, so instead of $48 million, you're, you're going with $36 million a year of generating um, excess revenues over expenses. Yeah, if, if I might jump in on that, um, I have a comment. This is Dawn Wise. I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. It's a policy question. It's really a, a question to be answered by our board as a whole. Um, I know that next week we're going to have our ad hoc rate setting committee meeting to talk about that, and I think that will be one of the topics um, that, that we'll need to grapple with. One of the things that um, I wanted to make sure our board was aware of um, since this happened since our last board meeting, um, PG&E has, has, has introduced a rate change that actually went into effect March 1st since our last board meeting. And I neglected to mention that in the CEO report, but um, it's important for you all to know that that, that resulted in a, um, a generation increase on, on the four PG&E customers which um, puts our customers really at a, a much uh, stronger advantage than they were before March 1st. Um, and the, they're now 
seeing a rate savings on their bill of between 2 and 5%. Um, whereas before it was closer to 1% or slightly lower. So um, I think that that's another element that's worth kind of factoring in, that, that um, the MCE customers are currently um, seeing a discount pretty much across the board. Um, but I think you're raising a fair question, which is should the discount be deeper um, in order to, you know, pass along more of that savings to customers, or is it worthwhile to build up the reserves so that we're able to achieve a credit rating sooner um, and have other things in place that could allow us to be more cost-effective in the long run? Um, it's a good policy discussion, I think, that you're seeing up. Along the, the same line, so in, in two years we reach our goal and we no longer have to generate the extra 40 plus million dollars in excess revenues, are there other things that we should be doing then is, or will we turn that into rate reductions or what is, what is your vision of that? Yeah, I'd love to comment on that. That's something that we've um, discussed a lot in the past um, at, at board meetings and technical committee and XCOM meetings. Um, and I, I think that the, the goal that the agency has had from the beginning is finding ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while um, providing, you know, stable rates um, and, you know, good customer service. Um, and getting more renewables onto the grid. So we already have some, we have quite a few programs in place that benefit our communities um, through greenhouse gas reductions and getting more renewables on the grid, like our feed-in tariff program, our energy efficiency programs. Um, and with, uh, without needing to continue building to reserves, we will certainly have a lot more opportunities to um, send some of the revenue into local programs. Um, and I think that will be a really exciting time where our board can engage on those policy discussions of where, where we can help um, accelerate growth towards our mission um, with, with that revenue. And in our most recent technical committee meeting, our staff presented an evaluation met matrix that we, we've been working on over the last year that will help us um, as, as a tool to help us determine which programs are the most cost effective um, and will achieve um, the greatest results as far as benefiting our communities while achieving our mission of greenhouse gas reductions. And I think that will help us kind of lay out the pros and cons of different programmatic ideas. Um, but that will be a really exciting point, I think, for us to, um, to get to so that we can start looking at ways um, to grow our programs. Uh, my next question is, almost more related to rates rather than... Could, could I stop you for just a second, Director Perkins, because uh, David McNeil, I think, wanted to add on to the prior okay. discussion, David. And I'm gonna, I want to give David yeah. a chance to do that, and then I'll come right back to you, Director McNeil. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to comment uh, that I think there's a very strong business case to moving forward with uh, adding to the reserves sooner rather than later. And the reason for that is that um, there's, there's no question that the price that we pay for energy is in part, in part a function of our risk profile. So as we improve our risk profile, we pay less for energy. Um, so the longer you kind of stretch out that, that, that process of getting to where you want, in the end, what's going to happen is, is our customers are going to have to pay more. Um, so I, 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 and by getting there quicker, you, you're, you're going to be able to procure energy more cheaply and, and pass on those savings to, to, to customers. Great. Thank you, David. Back to you, Director Perkins. Yeah, the, the other piece was as our light green starts to look a lot more like our dark green, how do we differentiate the rates in those? Um, as you get to 80 and 85 percent on the light green, it starts to look a lot like the dark green. Mm -hmm. And so how do we uh, manage those two systems to be different, or maybe they're not different anymore. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I can comment on that. And then we also have a question or a comment from Director Bierson. Um, I wanted to, um, just in response to your question, I think that um, the there are two key differentiators between the light green and the deep green product, which are likely to persist at least for the next five years. Um, you know, currently our deep green product is only coming from California-based resources, so it's a mix of wind and solar um, from California. Um, and then the other thing that really sets that product apart is that 50% of the revenue that comes in for our Deep Green program is funneled to local renewable development projects, like the MCE Solar One project. 
So that is another thing that really sets it apart from our light green uh, product. But, um, but you're correct that the light green product is on a trajectory to grow to where by 2025 it's expected to be 80% renewable. And, you know, long ago when, when MCE was being started up, I think the ultimate goal was that we get to a our one default product being 100% renewable. And so I think we will need to have that conversation again in the next, you know, five to seven years, and it's a, it's a valid question. Okay. Thank you. Director. Katie Versand, Concord. I'm very much in favor of keeping the two-year perspective, and the reason for that is basically a feeling that we're on the bubble right now, that if we've got two good years, let's put the money aside because we've been living on uh, overtime here on our economic uh, benefits, and we never know when there's going to be a fire like blow out Santa Rosa or whatever else is going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I believe that we should strike while the iron's hot. Let's get the money out. And then two years from now, we could have a great old discussion on where to spend $45 million. I love that kind of fight. <laughs> I, I wasn't necessarily suggesting that we do that, but I thought it was worth the discussion. No, I, I agree. With two versus three. I, mean, I understand it's worth the discussion, but I just wanted to outline my, my perspective yeah. of, yeah, let's do the two years because... Uh, I've seen where people kick things down the road, and boy, does that can keep rolling. Uh, you know, so while we got it, let's let's do it, and uh, then we can have the next discussion, which would be great. Great, super. Any other questions or comments from directors in Concord? Okay. Anything else from directors? Yes, Rupert. <clears throat> Hi, it's uh, Rupert Russell from Ross. Just a very quick question. Where are we in relation to reaching that reserve target? Maybe I missed something, but I, I didn't hear you describe where we are today versus where we want to get to. We're about 40% of our reserve target right now. So, and by the end of this fiscal year, so when we add this um, uh, additional contribution to reserves in the upcoming fiscal year, we'll be at about 75%. And then in the year following, we would, we would bring that to 100 I'm sorry, does that, sorry, are you saying that we're more or less at the 40% of reserves already? Ah, no, um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. I'm saying we're um, at about, as, if our, our target, it, reserve target is 40% of expenditures. Yeah. Um, right now we're at 16% of expenditures. That's what we have in reserves. So we're 40% of our target right now. And by the end of this coming year, we'll be 75% of our target. And then, um, and then reaching the full 100% of our target in the, in the year following. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else? Very good conversation, everyone. I appreciate it. And if there are no other questions or comments from directors, I'd entertain a motion. Uh, I move that we adopt the proposed amendment to MCE policy number 13. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 In the opposition? That's approved. Thank you, David. Great Thank job. You. Really good discussion. All right, so we're moving on now to item number nine, which is going to sound very familiar. It's our new board member additions to committees, but it's actually a new committee that we haven't discussed in the past. And Dawn, are you taking the lead on this? Yeah, I certainly am. So what you'll have what you have before you in your packet is a list of our current committees. This is just for reference. We've also included in this list the um, ad hoc audit committee members from 2017 as a point of reference. And at this time, we would like to form the ad hoc audit committee for 2018. Um, the the uh, description of this committee is also included in your packet. Um, and David can answer any questions about it. I think that the, the committee tends to meet uh, a couple times in uh, mid-May to late June, around the time that our uh, draft audit has been prepared um, and uh, responds to questions and in engages. Um, David, do you want to say any more about the committee to drum up some interest? <laughs> it's a lot Make of fun. Make it sound good. <laughs> 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 Nothing like auditing. 
Bob, thank, thank you for expressing an interest. I, that wasn't very upbeat sounding, was it? I, just, I meant it to sound a little more positive. <laughs> All right. So we have Bob, and he needs company on that committee. Andrew? Hey. Also good to have a rotation. Wonderful. I'm sorry, I, we couldn't hear you. And Do we have a volunteer in Concord? We do indeed. Um, Director Tatson has offered to um, step up for a second time. Fantastic. And I'm hoping we're getting Director McCullough here. So I, I was going to volunteer myself. We need you. But I wouldn't want to. No, no. There's space for you both. This. Can you hear me? No. Right in the middle. I'm pressing the middle. He's ready. There you go. Oh, oh we yeah. almost got it. There, there we go. go. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to volunteer my services so long as I don't displace someone else who either is an incumbent or badly wishes to join the committee. No, there's there's room for there's room for you, and we're glad Terrific. to have you. Terrific. All right. Count me in. Excellent. Anyone else in Concord, Don, who's uh, expressed an interest? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's it for Concord. So we have three three volunteers, which is certainly sufficient. But um, if anyone else is interested. Now's the time. All righty. Okay. Do you need formal approval of that committee? Yes, we our do. lawyer says we do. All right. Who wants to make a motion? Anker, you want to make a motion? I move we appoint the members as indicated for the audit committee for 2018. Second. Uh, second. All in favor? Lyman. Aye. 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 In your Aye. position. Thank you, everyone, uh, for volunteering. Much appreciated. All right. So moving on to item 10, which is uh, our second reading on streamlining public works contracting. And I'm not sure who's in charge. Beth, you're in charge of this one. All right. <clears throat> Recalcitrant microphones. Oh. There you go. You got oh, it. Oh, great. Okay. I got it. Um, so I'm not actually going to go as in depth uh, this time as we did last. As, as you all know, uh, during the last board meeting, two elements of this public works process happened. The first was your board adopted the um, Uniform Public Cost Accounting Act. There's a uniform uh, contracting procedure, or sorry, contracting costs uh, associated with that. And the second element was the first reading of the ordinance that establishes informal bidding procedure, procedures under the Uniform uh, Public Cost Accounting Act. And so currently, uh, without passage of this, uh, this ordinance, any project costing greater than 45,000 needs to go through a formal bidding process. And in order to streamline the process, make things um, more efficient and effective, we are asking that the board uh, approve the second reading of this ordinance so that there can be what's called informal bidding procedures, which is actually <coughs> reasonably formal uh, for uh, contracting amounts that range from uh, $45,000 to $175,000. And this relates to <coughs> public works specifically. So since we covered it in depth last time. I'm happy to take questions. All right. All right. Yeah, it seemed many good no. questions. <laughs> no. There's lots of heads shaking no over no here. No questions. <laughs> Have I heard any questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, who wants to make a motion and move forward? So moved. With a second. Second. All in favor? The, um, Aye. 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 Any opposition? I I believe for ordinances, we have to use the full language of the uh, recommendation. Uh, and Director Sears, can we get the name of the seconder? Ford Green from San Jose. It was Ford Green. It was Ford, but we have to be, do a redo so we sound more fulsome. Yeah, sorry. So the, the recommendation is to adopt ordinance number 2018-01 of the Board of Directors of Marin Clean Energy establishing informal bidding procedures under the Uniform Public Cost Accounting Act. Oh, <laughs> uh, there we go. So if I wish to make a motion, do I need to reread verbatim what you just said? Mm -hmm. uh, I move we adopt the ordinance as referenced by our general counsel. Second. Well done. 
Aye. Aye. Right. You get a lot of me today, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so I, this is actually going to be a pretty brief overview because at the last board meeting we had an overview by CC Song. So I just wanted to give a couple of quick updates. Uh, first, just uh, a lot of thanks to all of our board members who are serving as legislative ambassadors. Um, since the since our last meeting, we have completed all of our legislative meetings with all of our uh, assembly members. Uh, and senators representing the MCE service territory. So thank you very much to all the board members who have been participating in those meetings. It's very valuable. Um, another update is um, we had noted that the in last meeting that the investor and utilities had done a, uh, a or petition for modification of a decision that would allow them to market against CCAs without forming an independent marketing division. Uh, the Cal CCA responded to that and the details of that response is included in uh, the summary in your board packet. Uh, the commission is not actually required to take any action on the utilities uh, application. So uh, the third item is uh, at the last meeting we also discussed uh, the that the Public Utilities Commission had adopted Resolution 4907, which uh, in theory related to resource adequacy and the allocation of costs between bundled and unbundled customers, but the true impact was uh, really to delay the start of new community choice aggregators, and that was uh, the intent of the CPUC to do that. So uh, the city and county of San Francisco took the lead on this and they uh, filed a, uh, an app, a response to the, the um, to the, I'm sorry, an application for rehearing of the resolution, uh, basically outlining that it was an abuse of discretion by the CPUC, um, that it was an arbitrary and capricious decision. Um, and that, that actually is, those are sort of the magic words allowing for um, appeal to the courts above the CPUC. Uh, so that's sort of the regulatory framework there, um, that the CPUC failed to follow its own processes and procedures, and that the, the resolution is not supported by its findings. And then the last item I just want to note is on February 2nd, Cal CCA is going to be submitting uh, testimony in the PCIA proceeding, so power charge and dis difference adjustment. So this is the this is the major proceeding that is taking a look at reforming that methodology. Um, so I'm just, sorry, what date was that? Uh, yeah. April 2nd. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> it's getting a little late for me. Um, April 2nd is when that testimony is going to be filed. So um, Great. I'm sure everybody will be wrapped reading that mm -hmm. when it comes out. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Any, any questions or comments on our regulatory and legislative update? None. I have a sense that people are anxious to go home. Um, <laughs> any board member or staff matters before we do adjourn for the evening? Right. Seeing none. Thank you, everyone. I think I think the picture worked well tonight. We're adjourned. <laughs>